Today, I'm going to ask the question, why does God hide things in a secret, and how do we find them? Now, that's quite a question because everyone can have access to a Bible in their own language. God has made it that no one can have an excuse and say, God, I never knew. Well, his answer will be, did you have a Bible? Well, yes. Did you read it? No. Well, why didn't you? And some would say, well, I read it, but I couldn't understand it. Why is that? Okay. Because there are certain keys necessary for God to reveal. Okay? So let's begin with that. What's the first key? Very first key. Three letters. You all know it. Obey my voice. Right? And we have the Bible with the voice of God all written down, and Jesus said what concerning the voice of God? Man shall not live by bread alone, but what? By every word of God that proceeds out of his mouth. Correct? Okay. So, God is so great and so good and so powerful that in spite of the sins of all people in the world, he's caused his word to be spread around the world, and anyone at any time can have access to it, especially in this digital age. Daniel, the second chapter. Okay. Now, as we're turning there, what does the Bible tell us that who are those who have understanding? Those who keep the commandments of God. Okay. Now stop and think about it. Okay. One of the greatest events to take place in the history of mankind was when Israel was before God at Mount Sinai. And he spoke the Ten Commandments. All of the Israelites heard him. And so the Ten Commandments, let me ask you, do you know them? Do you keep them? And if you keep them, how do you keep them? Okay? That's a key. Now, we're going to see something else a little later on. But when God gave the Ten Commandments, that was on a, a Pentecost. And note this, we may not cover it all in this message, but all of the Sabbath and holy days of God, all give us important things in time and in history and in prophecy and in fulfillment. Okay. Daniel, the second chapter. God has said in the New Testament that it's given to those who love God to understand the mysteries or the secrets of God. Now, they're secrets because of the keys that are necessary to understand. Okay. First one is obey his voice. Next one, keep his Sabbath. And then the other of the nine commandments of God. And the next one is the Passover and holy days of God. Okay. Now let's stop and think about it for just a minute. Sabbath day, every seventh day, right? And in spite of the sins of the Jews, they have preserved the Old Testament, they have preserved the calculated Hebrew calendar. All God's days are based on his calendar. 
So I want you to think about all these things as we're going along. Okay. Now then, God deals with nations and his people and his church. All three. Now here in Daniel, the second chapter, we know what happened here. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Now he was king of Babylon. And he had a dream. And he pulled a slick one on his astrologers and soothsayers. He said, I had a dream. I want you to do two things. I want you to tell me what the dream was and what the interpretation is. And if you don't, you're going to lose your heads. Well, Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego were the Jewish young men who were taken captive and brought to Babylon. And the captain of the guard told it to Daniel and Meshach and Abednego, and they said, we'll pray to God and ask him to reveal what it was that the king did with this dream. Okay. So let's pick it up here. Daniel 2, verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companion, that's Meshach uh, and Abednego, okay, that they might pray for the mercies of God in heaven concerning this secret. That Daniel and his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So God is the revealer of secrets. But he gives conditions to understand those secrets, as we'll see a little bit later. So what did Daniel do? Okay. And he blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons and removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding, and he reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness and the, the light that dwells with him. So I thank you and praise you, O God, of our fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has now made known to me what we desired of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So then he was taken before the king. And here's what was told the king. Okay. And Daniel answered before the king and said, Verse 27 now. The secret which the king has demanded cannot be shown to the king by the wise men, the enchanters, the astrologers, and the magicians. All right? Who is the god of those enchanters, astrologers, and magicians? Satan the devil. Okay? Now think of it today. Think of it today. Do any of the religions of the world understand anything about the plan of God? No. Okay? Even many of the fake Christianity may understand some parts, but they don't understand it the way they should. Why? Because they have half knowledge. Remember, one of the keys, understanding, Sabbath keeping. And Sunday keeping will never do it. You may guess some parts, but you'll never really understand it. Okay, let's go on. And the king answered and said, verse 26, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in the interpretation. 
And Daniel answered before the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot be shown by the wise men, the enchanters, the astrologers, or the magicians. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. From that time, clear down to the end. Okay? In an outlined form. A little sidebar with that. Daniel and all of his prophecies are the lock to the framework. Revelation and all of the things given to the Apostle John are the key to open the lock. But all of those things to put together is based upon do you love God and keep his commandments? See, all of it. Never forget that. Have made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. As for you, O king, while upon your bed your thoughts came to you of what should come to pass hereafter, he who reveals secrets is made known to you what shall come to pass. Now notice Daniel's attitude. This is what is important. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living man. Now think about that. But so that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your head. So then he describes it. Man with a head of gold, chest of silver, and then brass, and then iron, and then iron and clay. And that one image represents the major kingdoms of this world from that time down to the end. Okay? Now, verse 44, right down to the, the toes of the feet, the ten kings. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and that's the whole gospel. See? Isn't that true? Now think about this. In every single book of the Bible, it talks about the kingdom of God. Either directly or indirectly, shall never be destroyed. And that's pictured by the coming Feast of Tabernacles. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. Okay? Now notice, we need to also understand this. God is true. God cannot lie. His word is true. There is no lie in anything that he has in the scriptures. Men trying to twist it their own way may make it look like a lie. Okay? And that's also part of what we have to believe. Now notice this. Even though Nebuchadnezzar had an outline of understanding... He really didn't know the details. Is that true? But notice what he said. Verse 45. Because you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it had broken pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. Now notice the next sentence. And you can depend upon this with every single word of God. And the dream is certain, and its interpretation is certain. Okay. Now, how much time from Nebuchadnezzar down to the end? Well, Babylonian Empire, middle of the 5th century B.C., well over 2,500 years. 
quite a thing indeed, all the way there. Let's see how this fits in with the New Testament. First Peter, the first chapter, let's pick it up here in verse 2. Verse 2, first chapter, first Peter. Who have been chosen according to the predetermined knowledge of God the Father, under sanctification through the Spirit. Now, notice this. He's talking about all of us who have been called, baptized, received the Holy Spirit, have understanding of the Bible. Okay? Very important. Unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say the law had been done away. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope. Now what is that hope? The hope of eternal life, right? But notice what it says there. Begotten us again. Now if you don't have our articles on what do you mean born again? What do you mean born of God? You need to write for it. See? When you were conceived, you were begotten by your father. That was your first begettal. Then you were born. That was your first birth. Then when you repent and receive the Holy Spirit of God, you receive the begettal of God's Spirit in your, in your mind, and then... When the resurrection comes, that's when you're born again. See? Now, it's really that simple. Okay? Begotten us again, lively hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, reserved in heaven for us, which Christ is going to bring. Okay? Who are being safeguarded by the power of God through faith. That's why it's important to believe, and that's faith, to love, and that's what God wants, to obey and do what he says. For salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last days. Okay. Now, let's come over here to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And here we find out that God does reveal things and reveals them when we need to understand them. And there are many things, even in the Old Testament, as we're going to see in a little bit, that are prophecies in action of things that are going to take place way in the future. And all of those will be major events. Okay? A little sidebar. I've got two books at home written by two different people who think they know the prophecies. They don't. They don't understand them. Why? Because they're trying to solve them their way rather than let the Bible interpret the Bible to give understanding. That, a big difference. Okay. Verse 9. According as it is written, the eye has not seen nor the ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now keep that in mind. Everyone wants God's love to them. Everyone wants God's love and forgiveness to For themselves, but how many people want to love God in return the way that God says we should do it? All right, let's go on. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. So if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not going to understand it. And how do you receive the Spirit of God? You repent and be baptized. And what did Peter say about that? He said that God reveals it to those who obey him. 
No one's going to receive the Spirit of God without obeying God. Just not going to happen. Revealed to us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, which are what? Hidden in the Bible. But He will reveal them. For who among men understands the things of a man except by the Spirit of man which is in him? In the same way also, the things of God no one understands except by the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world. What is the Spirit of the world? Who does that come from? That comes from Satan the devil. but the Spirit that is of God, so that is what it is. We might know the things graciously given to us by God. Quite an interesting thing. Now, how many have watched Fox News and and, uh, have seen uh, Water's World? He used to go out and take take his microphone and cameraman, and they'd go out in the streets of New York and ask them different questions. Even some people don't even know who the president is. Okay? Even some people did not know who Columbus was. Okay? That's in the world lost. (laughs) Okay? If you ask them anything about God, their eyes would probably roll back like on a, on a, a gambling machine. Okay? Spirit of the world is Satan, but the spirit that is of God that we might know. That's what God wants us to understand. Okay? Now then, let's come here to Isaiah 56. And this will be very enlightening for us. Now then, let's look at it. And see what it says. Verse 1. Thus says the Lord. Well, whenever it's thus says the Lord, that's God speaking directly to you. Even though we may have spoken it a long time ago, makes no difference because His Word is spirit and life. So it's still active today. Okay? Keep justice And do righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Anybody remember a a scripture? Psalm 119, 172. All your commandments are righteous. Question. If you're not keeping the commandments of God, you're practicing what? unrighteousness or lawlessness, correct? If all of his commandments are righteous, that has to be true. Okay? For my salvation is near to come. This is toward the end of the age. Prophecy of our time. And my righteousness to be revealed. Now, what's the first thing going to reveal the righteousness of God that's going to startle the world? Actually shake the world down to the core. First thing. Revelation 6.12. When the heavens are rolled back as a scroll and the sign of the Son of Man is revealed. And the whole earth is going to go into convulsions. That's the first revelation of the righteousness of God. Demonstrably to the whole world. Now that's so powerful that 144,000 of the children of Israel repent and a great innumerable multitude repent. So that's going to be a startling event, okay? To be revealed. Now notice what he says here. Verse 2, this is the key. 
Blessed is the man who does this, and the Son of Man who lays hold upon it. And that means you grab it, and it's like something you take to your bosom, so to speak. Who keeps Sunday? Uh Uh-oh, slip of the tongue. Who keep the Sabbath? from profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Now think about that. Not only the things that are evil, but when you're doing things that are normal, when you do it on a Sabbath day, it becomes an evil thing because you're rejecting what God has said. But people are blinded because they don't know. And do let the son of the stranger who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated us from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me. And that's the key. When we love God and keep his commandments, we're doing the things that please God, right? Yes. And takes hold of my covenant. And that's the covenant of eternal life. Even to them will I give within my house. Now notice, what is God's house? Ultimately, what is God's house? New Jerusalem, right? Yes. And within my walls a place and a name better, that of sons and daughters, and I will give him an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. In other words, eternal life. You have to have eternal life in order to have an everlasting name, correct? Also the sons of the stranger who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath from profaning the Sabbath and takes hold of my covenant. Now think of that. It is rarely taught that those who keep the Sabbath are going to be in the kingdom of God. But this is exactly what it's telling us. Now, we'll read something in a minute here, another part. Notice what he says. Verse 7, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, which is the mountain of New Jerusalem, and will make them joyful in my house of prayer their burnt offerings, their sacrifices to be accepted upon my altar. That's only when they had the sacrifices then. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Where was this stated in the New Testament? Gospel of John, chapter 2. And what did Jesus do? Remember what he did? He went in, made a scourge, drove out the money exchangers, the cattle, the birds, and everything else, and scattered their money all over. Can you imagine? Just think the mad dash of them. Oh, I got to get my money, got to get my money. (laughs) You know, then he said, you have made this a den of merchandise, but it should be the house of God, a prayer for all people. Okay. What was the proposition that God gave to Israel just before he gave the Ten Commandments? Remember what that was? Okay, hold your place here and come to Exodus 19. We'll just refresh our memory. Okay. Here's what Israel was to do down through all time. 
because God gave them his commandments and his word. Okay, there we go. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, this brings together many of the things that we've already covered. Now, he's speaking to Moses, and he says, let's go back to verse 4. This is what he was to tell the Israelites. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. Was that a major event in history? You know how long it took Egypt to recover from the destruction that God brought upon them? 400 years. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, notice, God always gives the condition to us. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandments then. Remember, whenever you see an if, look for the, the then. Okay? Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Well, all the details came later. Okay? But they said, yes, all that God has said we will do. Then they heard the voice of God, and they got scared to death and all afraid, and they said, Moses, 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 you speak to us. You go to God and listen, and you tell us what God says, and we'll do it. But they never, never did it. They didn't, they couldn't even do it for 40 days and 40 nights, right? When Moses was on the top of Mount Sinai getting the rest of the laws, the commandments, statutes, and judgments, and all the instructions on how to build the tabernacle and everything. They came to Aaron and said, hey, we don't know what happened to this guy Moses. He said, went up on a mountain, you know, look, it's like a volcano. Maybe he fell in and died. Make us God. So what did Aaron do? He made a golden calf. Okay. After they said, yes, we will do all that you say. Okay. Now notice what God has said. And this carries right down to today. Isaiah 43 and verse 21. Just think what the world would be. Now I have a sermon. What would the world be like if Adam and Eve had not sinned? It would be quite a different place than it is today. Let's ask another question. What would the world have been like if the 12 tribes of Israel had been faithful to God and carried the word of God to the whole world? Even back then. Remember, it was conditional. Okay? If you will obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be a kingdom of priests to me. Okay? But they never did it. When they went into the promised land, finally got in there, after 40 years of wandering in Mount Sinai and around the Sinai Peninsula because of their sins, they finally, they finally were able to get in. Okay? And what did they do after Joshua and the elders died? They started going after the gods of the other people. So Israel has been like a roller coaster of waves. They come to God for so long, and then they get down depraved. And then God has to send a judge to raise them up, get them out of their their depths. We're right in one of those low places right now. Now, will we come up out of it for the time being? We don't know. We'll have to see. Okay? But notice what God says. Isaiah 43, 21. This people that I form from myself... They shall declare my praise. Now read the next verse. Yet you have not called upon me. O Jacob, much less have you troubled yourself about me, O Israel. See? Now learn this. You go back and you look at all the promises that God gave to the twelve tribes of Israel. Because of who? 
Abraham, right? Now, when God makes a promise, he'll never break it. Now, what happens if sin comes along? Then there will be punishment, and if there is repentance, go forward again. So look at what God, just another sidebar, look at what God promised David. That you would always have someone sitting on the throne of Israel. Always. Never missing. Never lacking. Then he has a sin with Bathsheba. God gave the promise so he doesn't break his word, so he gave punishment against David for what he did. The child died, and there was near revolution by his own family against him, and Absalom wanted to take over the kingdom. Okay? That was his punishment, see? But God never changed his pledge. Okay? So likewise with Israel. If they come back to God, even halfway, God will still give them a little correction, but will be with them and bless them. Okay? Now the church, you look at Revelation 2 and 3. I'll just let you go through that and see what happens with the churches. Okay. What does it say about God? I am what? The same yesterday and today and forever. Both the Father and the Son. Okay. Verse 21. Okay. Now this is what the world cannot really understand. Verse 21. In the same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you did hide these things from the wise and intelligent and did reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for it was well-pleasing in your sight to do so. Doesn't that sound like tying in with Daniel, who said, I'm nothing more than any other person, but God is the one who gave the secret, right? Okay. Then he turned to his disciples and said, All things are delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the One. See? Now this is important. And the one to whom the Son personally chooses to reveal him. Now that's quite a thing. Okay. Very interesting. You won't find any other translation this way. The Son personally chooses. Now why did I do it that way? There's a special verb in the Greek called the middle voice verb. Okay? Now, most action by the subject. I'm the subject. I see Jack. Okay? That's direct. Okay. Middle voice is God is the subject and the object. His calling is the object back to himself. So therefore, to translate it personally shows the personal involvement that God wants in our lives. Okay? Very important. Verse 23, And he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that have seen the things that you have seen, for I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see the things that you see and have not seen them, and to hear the things that you hear and have not heard them. Okay? Now then, he gets right down to the very core, right here. Verse 25. Now, a certain doctor of the law, he's the one who understood the law, you know, like you might say the top theologians today, stood up tempting him, saying, Master, 
what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, all of you out there, if you're Sunday keepers and you're listening to this, understand what is being said by Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, then you better believe what he says. And if you think you're going to have eternal life, you better see how he says you're going to have eternal life, or you're just deluding yourself because your Sunday keeping is doing you no good, spiritually speaking. All right? So he said to them, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Then he answered, That is the doctor of the law. He knew it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Question. All Sunday keepers, do you do this? What is the love of God? 1 John 5, 3. This is the love of God, what? that we keep his commandments, and what? His commandments are not burdensome. They are freedom. Freedom from sin. See? So then he wanted to know, well, who's my neighbor? Well, doctor of the law. He was like a priest. So he gave him a parable and saying, There was a certain man who was robbed, beaten up, and left over in the side of the ditch to die. And along came a priest and saw him and went clear to the other side of the road as he was going up to do his religious duty at the temple and did nothing to him. And then along came a Levite, and he looked over, ooh, look at the blood and all of that. And he walked up. He had to get to the temple so he could help offer the sacrifices. And then along came a Samaritan. Now, Samaritan is like saying the most cursed people on earth to a Jew. Okay? He came and took the man, cleaned up his wounds, put oil and wine in it, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him when he left because he had to go to Jerusalem and do some business, told the innkeeper, now, here some money for you, you take care of him, and if it's more than that, when I come back, I'll pay you. So he asked the doctor of the law after that parable, who do you suppose loved his neighbor? And the doctor of the law said, well, I suppose the Samaritan. And that was probably hard for him to say. Okay. All right. We're going to look at some scriptures and understand some really deep things of God. 